It has been 10 years since Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio was elected into the papacy. Since that time, there were ups and downs on how Christianity is treated by both outsiders and believers. In short, the papacy of Pope Francis has polarized Catholics over the past decade. Have you ever heard of the saying, if America sneezes, the whole world gets sick in the context of geopolitics? The same applies with Rome and the Catholic Church in terms of faith and morals, especially amongst Christians. And in the 21st century, Christianity has been highlighted thanks to modern technology, both for the right and wrong reasons. Now more than ever, with the recent explosion of faith-based topics becoming more and more highlighted by secular news outlets from Amores Laetitia, to Tradiciones Custodes, to The Chosen, to the Asbury re- Revival, where is Christianity going? Or if we can recall, Peter asked Jesus when he was escaping Rome and persecution when he was about to get martyred. Qua vadis? Where are you going? This is what we should ask ourselves as this episode of the Intrepid Podcast is recorded during the season of Lent. I am Ian Rignon, an independent alternative media practitioner, among other things. Welcome to another episode of the Intrepid Podcast. In this episode, we talk about Christianity in the 21st century, where it's going, and why media frenzies like The Chosen and Jesus Revolution and other, uh, and other stuff uh, are pivotal in how Christians of all stripes live out their faith. Now, dear friends, this is actually the second time that I am uh, recording or re-recording this podcast episode. I did... Uh, uh, a recording of it, but I was not really satisfied with the commentary that I made, so here we are. Anyway, let me give you some context as to why we are, why are we talking about this in the first place. First of all, we all know that COVID-19 disrupted religious services back in 2020, and um, they were halted uh, for practical reasons, and it's just um, sad that a lot of people had to deal with had to deal with uh, staying at home and praying to God that this pandemic might end and ended it did. Thanks be to God. But then again, during that time, a lot of people were distraught that they cannot attend church services, they cannot go to mass and all that. and uh one of the main or one of the first ever um things that the catholic church did was to um uh basically uh tell catholics and all uh and all christians in general to uh pray that this pandemic might end and uh, the pope pope francis um declared an extraordinary or announced that there's there's an extraordinary urbi et orbi uh, during Lent of 2020. So uh, for 2020, there are three um, three uh, days or three events that the urbi et orbi blessing, which is the, uh, the Pope's blessing uh, to the city of Rome and to the world, uh, occurred. Normally, there's two, an Easter Sunday and then Christmas. But... Uh, a third one in 2020 before those two uh, happened. So uh, it's a very rare thing. Oh, anyway, there's a fourth instance that these uh, Orbi et Orbi blessings uh, are are done. Uh, it was in the, the election of a pope. So uh, every time a, a, po- a new pope is elected, uh, one of his first acts was to um, um, give... Uh, the people, uh, the Urbi et Orbi blessing, 
especially those who have gathered in St. Peter's Square uh, during the Conclave days. And um, that's just the backstory of the Orbi at Or- Orbi Blessing. So, so much for that. Now, because of this uh, lack, or should I say, um, necessary uh, restrictions back then, there were uh, uh, there was a rise in uh, of religious internet sources and platforms that provide some kind of um spiritual or theological or religious um satisfaction uh to uh to those who uh to those who believe so uh, a lot of facebook pages youtube channels uh instagram accounts uh even tiktok has those uh, those kind of things and uh, there was um there was an overabundance during that time and i just hope that it would uh, it would be sustained now that we have gone through all of that pandemic all those um pandemic years so that's just my uh, that's just my hope so because of all of these um because of all of these uh happenings in the past 3 years a lot of people are looking into god or looking into uh, some kind of higher being that uh, would end this plague that we are uh, that we were experiencing back then, and a lot of them were not disappointed. One of those very uh, good, uh, one of those very good um, contents, or should I say, um, uh, outlets wherein uh, religion is being um being shared on social media especially christianity is this um streaming and tv series called the chosen directed by dallas jenkins and it also stars jonathan rumi as jesus now jonathan rumi has not been a stranger to being uh to being uh, to portray uh the role of jesus because uh, he has done it, uh, he has done it for a long time now, and basically the chosen was his uh, was his uh, latest and uh, by far most uh, successful uh, stint in playing uh, playing the Lord and Savior of all. So, uh, and to boot, Jonathan Rumi is a Catholic, so uh, I did sense that there is some kind of uh some kind of um catholicism being uh <laughs> how do i say this how um uh, a lot uh, a lot of catholicism being uh um uh, uh outlined in uh in the series uh i think the most obvious is uh his uh um how he portrayed Jesus and his relationship to Mary his mother and uh he was very much a a loving son to uh to uh to mother Mary and uh, mother Mary portrayed by Vanessa Benavente uh uh for a fact is actually younger than Jonathan so uh a lot of um a lot of people uh commend the team behind the chosen for making Vanessa look so old uh in the uh look so old uh in the series so that's um uh at least uh at least the people are shout, uh giving them a shout out for for what they do and you know it's very commendable that they are doing this i have to say anyway so um uh the chosen has been as of this recording uh has finished 3 seasons and uh, as of this recording they are uh beginning uh filming uh season 4 out of 7 that they have planned and uh yes uh they're almost halfway of the of the planned um of the planned uh, plot or arc of this uh, or the uh, the whole of the whole series and uh I am looking forward to a lot of things but I'll deal with that later on. Now, why am I so hooked with the chosen? Not, not I'm not really. I'm not really, but you know 
as an independent alternative media practitioner and as someone who has uh, lived, studied and lived uh, media, even though I'm not, I haven't had uh, a personal experience when it comes to uh, working in the media or in media production or in, uh, in this case, uh, film production, sort of, I can definitely uh i can definitely give them a huge sh- huge shout out because they are basically uh they're basically getting or should i say uh i don't know what to say they are just um giving life to the gospel stories now the chosen as they say is not really a biblically accurate um, biblically accurate um, series, and it isn't. Uh, they clearly intended it not to be, but they are basically just trying to uh, make it as uh, as faithful as possible to the biblical texts. And besides, uh, the main reason why the chosen was. Uh, was produced in the very first place is for uh, for people to read uh, the very source that these stories Dallas Jenkins and the rest of his team is uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, put uh, put to life or um, bring to life uh, in in both uh, the small big small screen big screen and even in the nano screen of our uh, of our mobile devices so as of this point, I can definitely tell the chosen is doing its uh, uh, what it's purposed to do, and I do commend all of them for that. Uh, for that matter. So, aside from Jonathan Rumi, and I'll deal with Jonathan later on. Uh, he's an absolutely great um, actor, I have to tell you. But there are also a, a lot of um, actors as well who are uh, who are giving it all in this series. Uh, you have Vanessa Benavente as Mother Mary or Mama Mary in our context. And then you have uh, Liz Tabish who uh, portrays uh, Mary Magdalene or Maria Magdalena. So uh, her acting was absolute spot on. Even in the pilot episode on, in season one, it was, it, was just, uh, it was just top quality. I have to commend Liz for that. And then you have Lara Silva, who plays Eden, uh, uh, in the Bible. Um, Simon Peter's uh, mother-in-law was mentioned, but not his wife. So they are basically um, uh, using creative or artistic liberty for this. And there are a lot of creative, creative and artistic liberties in creating the chosen, because there's also. Um, there's also uh, a character named Rama or Rama, uh, played by uh, Yasmin Al Bustami, who happens to have partial Filipino uh, heritage. Uh, she's primarily Jordanian, uh, Jordanian Palestinian, so she speaks Arabic. But uh, <laughs> after some uh, other uh, some research, um, it's probable that her mom is a Filipina. So that's just me. But anyway. Uh, that's besides the point. Uh, Yasmin Al Bustami is actually uh, is also actually a, a career actress. Uh, she has a lot of uh, she had a lot of gigs as well. Uh, she has a, a lot of gigs as well. Uh, aside from the chosen, she is also uh, she's also uh, uh, she was also she's also involved in NCIS Hawaii as of this recording. So. Uh, she re- she's really a little bit of a, you know, um, in the mid tier of actors, and so is Ala Saf- Ala Safi, um, who plays Simon the Zealot. Uh, he's an absolute martial art. I mean, uh, he portrayed Z as um uh the martial artist or the uh, or the or some kind of. A bodyguard role uh, in the in the roster of the apostles, because Allah is actually uh, a stunt actor or a, uh, a stunt actor, and uh, 
yeah, um, for, uh, in his future projects, he is also involved with uh, Indiana Jones, uh, latest uh, installment of Indiana Jones, which is going to be um, shown or uh, will be uh, released by June of this year, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, I, I'm very happy about Allah for that. Uh, who else? I don't know if any other um any other person who uh oh Shahar Isaac yes uh Shahar Isaac plays as Simon Peter he's going to be a lot uh he's going to be involved in a lot of this most likely in the in the uh next few seasons it's going to be focused on him and Jesus it's going to be focused on his character in Jesus uh because Simon Peter in season 3 uh, had this very huge uh, has this very huge uh, scene. Spoiler alert! If you haven't watched season three, stop this recording right now and watch it, or uh, proceed at your own risk. Hi, Post Brody in here. So uh, I actually wanted to uh, add another uh, character or another actor uh, who is uh, portraying a character in the Chosen, and that is Paras Patel. He plays Matthew. And uh, for some reason, Dallas Jenkins and uh, and the writers of The Chosen coded Matthew as autistic. Now, as someone who has been suspecting uh, autism in uh, in the in the past year, I am very much um, happy that. Uh, uh, Paras is uh, acting, uh, acting out Matthew, and he's acting at um, Matthew in a way that is not really that, um, not really that um, uh, offensive to um, to autistics, and um, and perhaps it's a good um, it's a good thing that uh, uh, Matthew. Uh, was coded as autistic, and it just makes uh, it just makes this um very great that uh an autistic character is in the chosen. He's included in the uh, in the apostles, and um he is different, but nevertheless, because uh from being a tax collector, he he was basically now uh, chronicling the. The stories and the accounts of uh, how he lived with Jesus, and in season three, um, I just noticed how Matthew transformed from being uh, a very uh, a very quirky, non uh, nonchalant, and uh, you know, uh, uh, unusual or uncer- uncertain uh, person to being a little bit more convicted. Uh, in the in the ministry, and uh, this change or this um, development of uh, of uh, Matthew's character, uh, uh, while being coded as autistic in our in our um, in our modern lens, is just very 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 uh, good. That uh, there are some autistic adults who commend. Uh, Matthew's portrayal in the Chosen. So for the, f- so this is one of the first times that uh, a non-autistic character nailed it because uh, there are some in the autistic community who wants a very great representation in the media, and you know, Paras just nailed it. As someone who has been suspecting and as someone who knows some autistic people. I can definitely uh, vouch for um, Matthew's portrayal here. And if I am not mistaken, Dallas is also suspecting himself to be uh, neurodivergent. I am not sure if it's autism or ADHD or whatever. But uh, he's a different kind of uh, filmmaker, director, and auteur. So I'm just trying to throw it in. So anyway, back to Simon Peter. So what happened is that... uh, Simon Peter uh, walked on the water with Jesus. That was the season finale of season three. And what I do like about The Chosen is that 
what the Bible does not uh, pr- uh, provide uh, for some reason, and I do understand why, uh, the people behind The Chosen are creating backstories on this so that it would contextualize the it would contextualize the biblical texts or the uh the biblical con- or the conversations that were recorded in the gospels so for example in the walking on water scene this was the very final scene in uh in season 3 of the chosen uh the writers behind it provided a very, very um, heart-stringy backstory between Peter, Simon Peter, and Eden, uh, basically uh, Shahar's and Lara's character. So, uh, at the in the beginning of season of season three, uh, in the first episode of season three, uh, they, I mean, uh, not really the beginning, but. Uh, during the during the course of season three, uh, the, the characters of uh, Shahar and Lara, uh, uh, the couple basically Simon Peter and Eden, uh, were uh, eager to have a child, and uh, for some reason, uh, Eden got pregnant, but uh, was still born. So basically, uh, she lost. Uh, their baby and uh, it had a lot had a very huge implication when it comes to uh, the mental health of both uh, Simon Peter and Eden that when Simon Peter was uh, discovered that he he was a father but he never got to hold his child he lashed out his anger on in God and uh, and what I liked about uh, the the finale of season three is that um, the walking wa- on on water scene is actually uh, the aftermath of a bet of a of a much more popular uh, much more popular um, much more popular uh, miracle that Jesus uh, made, and that was the feeding of the five thousand. Ironically, <laughs> uh, I am recording this in the fourth. Tuesday of Lent, the fourth week of Lent, and the Sunday in that uh, in uh, of that fourth week of Lent, fourth Sunday of Lent is called Leitare Sunday, and that's the, uh, the second of two um, uh, days in the Catholic liturgical year, and maybe in the Anglican liturgical year too, if they are very much uh, Anglo-Catholic. Wherein the priest wears rose vestments, not purple rose, not pink rose, and the gospel reading for the uh, for Leitare Sunday, at least in the older form of the of the Catholic Mass, pri- prior to to the nineteen sixties, was actually the feeding of the five thousand. So. It's just, uh, it's just, um, it just inter- interconnects with my, uh, with my point here. And going back to Simon Peter, he has the faith, and he believes that Jesus would multiply the five loaves and two fish so that he can, uh, so that he can feed the five thousand that listened to him. And uh, it was absolutely, you know, it was absolutely uh, a good thing however uh he was still personally distraught at the at the sight of a of a missing infant uh sorry for the pun alex kister <laughs> but yeah um they uh, he's still distraught that he that he cannot experience becoming a father because the uh, their baby uh, uh his baby with eden uh uh, was not born alive and uh, it's really it's really um it's re- it in in that case if, if i were si- simon peter i would do absolutely the things that he did in that uh <laughs> in the series and maybe much worse so uh that's that's just me but anyway 
uh, because of this, uh, he just wanted to uh, get this get this done, and then uh, the thing is when they uh, when the apostles uh, tried to row back row back to the sea of uh, to Capernaum in the Sea of Galilee, uh, it stormed, and uh, it uh, you know. Uh, the apostles were not going anywhere. They were trying to row back to Capernaum, and then Jesus walked in the water. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the conversation that Jesus and Simon Peter had never uh, was never recorded in Scripture. Now, this is another case of artistic or creative liberty done absolutely spot on because... Uh, Given Simon Peter's backstory and uh, contextualizing it in the walking on water scene, uh, Jesus asked uh, Simon Peter if he can uh, if he can walk on the water if he uh, if he calls Simon Peter and uh, Simon Peter says absolutely if you can command if you can command that the water to hold me I will walk on it and uh, and then Jesus asked why are you upset and then. Simon Peter just lost it. He just ranted that uh, you've been doing a lot of these things to other people, but but you're not doing this these things to your uh, to your own people, to your own person. Look at me. I was I am supposed to be a father, and uh, you didn't do something about it, and then. Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus just says, come, walk on the water. But then, Dallas Jenkins and the writers of The Chosen quoted another line of Jesus's. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. That, my friends, was a great, um, was a great contextualization of the Gospels. While I am obliged not to uh, not to believe in that as as it that that's the thing that really happened, it was really convincing at the very least from a secular media standpoint that you're quoting scriptures, uh, the, you're quoting sacred scripture for that um for that scene, even if in actuality, if you take it literally. In the Gospels, he didn't say it in that uh in that scene or in that story or in that uh in the story of the walking on the water. So, yeah, I cannot uh I cannot um uh praise it enough that they uh that uh the people behind the chosen are doing this so greatly, and what's uh, and to boot uh. Simon Peter's walking on the water was juxtapositioned with Eden's uh, ritual cleansing because uh, I understand that uh, there was there are there's a purification rite for women who gave uh, who gave birth whether or not uh, the child was born alive or was stillborn. So uh, that juxtapositioning in itself hooked me. I mean, I have. Uh, I have been watching a lot of movies. I have watched a lot of scenes, a lot of, um, and I have known film theories from uh, my own studies ten years ago, and I am still fascinated on how the people behind the chosen executed it. Because, wow, <laughs> it was just so parallel. You, you know what I mean? Simon Peter singing, sinking into the water uh, and then Eden dunking herself into the pool at the same instance. And then when uh, Jesus pulled Simon Peter out of the water, Eden also resurfaced from the pool. And you know, there's also one one more thing that is theologically uh, theologically um 
uh, fascinating about this scene. And not a lot of people have noticed this. Maybe I'm one of the few, but I may be wrong. It's also a good um, theolog- theologization of baptism. You see, um, there are a lot of people in the comment sections or uh, who have noticed uh, that when Simon Peter uh, resurfaced from the water when he sank and almost drowned, the subtitles in The Chosen uh, changed from Simon to Peter. I mean, he, uh, I, perhaps uh, Peter became a changed man in that in that sense, uh, that he was sort of baptized, not really by fire, but by, uh, by trials. And, um, it's just too lovely, man. I, I never really thought that, I mean, this is just my own thinking, that this might be something related to baptism, but, you know, I'm I'm um I'm willing to be corrected if I'm wrong, but uh in in how I see it, the walking on water scene uh portrays baptism. So that's just me. Anyway, I have spent half a minute or half an hour rather uh talking about the chosen uh half of it uh about the walking on water scene. Let's go now to Jonathan Rumi because as I Mentioned earlier, Jonathan Rumi is a Catholic actor, and it's just um, not really weird, but fascinating or interesting that he is also portraying the role of Lonnie Frisbee in the film Jesus Revolution. Now, Jesus Revolution is a film regarding the Jesus movement of the late 1960s to early 1970s. Now, Lonnie Frisbee looks like Jesus. Long hair, has a mustache and beard, uh, a little bit Caucasian, and you know, he's this kind of uh, typical guy who really looks like Jesus. He's a hippie pastor, and basically the Jesus movement um, is uh, depicted as uh, an era where hippies go to church. Now, if if you remember uh, your history very well, the 1960s was very much tumultuous because uh, there's the Vietnam War, there's uh, the sexual revolution, there's uh, there's this disdain for the old and the uh, fascination for the new. There's also the civil rights movement in the, in the United States, in our place. Uh, it's the uh, it's the era of uh, uh, it's an era of uh, trouble here in the Philippines and also in, uh, elsewhere in the world. But since the sexual revolution and the hippie movement uh, was rampant in the, in the United States, as I said in the intro, it spread across. It's also spread across the world, uh, except, in, uh, except in the Warsaw Pact. So that's just how I see it. At the same time, uh, the 1960s was also uh, a time or a period of, uh, of aggiornamento or uh, an opening up or of a, a change in the Catholic Church because the 1960s was actually the time or was actually the period of the Second Vatican Council or Vatican II. Now, as a Catholic and as someone who loves history, who has this uh, media mindset as well uh, ingrained in my brain because of my studies, uh, I am just wondering, was this the reason why the original intent of Vatican II regarding sacred liturgy failed? Because the 1960s was also a time where liturgical abuses were also were, were absolutely rampant. Even until now, actually, but since ni- since the 1960s, I mean, it started in the 1960s. That's 
um i would uh i would uh, leave it at that so uh because of the jesus movement a lot of hippies uh went to church and some of them became catholics and these catholics wanted something that is um a little bit more relevant to their own uh to their own uh lived experiences and while it is um while it is a good uh well it is a good thing uh in uh in some areas the sacred liturgy is not is not one of them and yet it's um it's rampant sadly but here's the nuance at least people believe in god at least these hippies believe in god it's not as perfect as we wanted it to be but who's perfect anyway so that's uh that's how i see it and this belief in god and uh and the recent uh the recent explosion of faith-based media whether it's um whether it's videos facebook posts trends uh trends um uh things that uh people uh people uh release on tiktok or whatever it it sparked a fire that seems to be unending and i am going now and uh and this is the perfect transition rather to uh to talk about the asbury revival or quote unquote asbury revival because yeah it was a thing it was a thing in february and I was supposed to uh, record this earlier or as part of the intrepid show, but then again, uh, I am I'm a little bit busy at this point, and they really just wanted to um, release this before uh, Lent ends and uh, we go to Holy Week or Passion Tide, because after the fourth week of Lent is already Passion Tide in the old calendar of the church. So that's just my uh, that's just me. Also, I I am also uh, going on uh, bicycle rides uh, this week as well as of this recording, because it's also the anniversary of uh, the Tejeros, Tejer, Tejeros Convention as well as the birthday of General Emilio Aguinaldo. And I live in Cavite, or Intrepid HQ is within Cavite, so might as well do that. Anyway, back to the topic. So the Asbury revival is actually uh 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 an incident where college students of asbury university in some sleepy town in kansas or kentucky or in the in the united states i think it's kentucky that's uh that uh that's the state uh somewhere within the united states it's a sleepy town it just has a population of around uh, it's just a small town that's for sure that um uh, and it happened to be uh, the campus of the Asbury University. So that's just me. Now, uh, college students during that time uh, went to uh, a regular uh, daily uh, service, and this is a Methodist uh, university, by the way. Uh, it was a it was a Methodist um, service, and after that service, uh, these college students had the urge to spontaneously uh, to just stay in the church or in the university chapel uh and um continue to pray and uh, continue to pray and worship the lord now if you're a catholic this seems alien to you and i understand as someone who has a spanish filipino catholic heritage this is also absolutely foreign to me but hear me out this non-stop service lasted about two weeks and what's um what's fascinating is that people or Christ, Christ, christians of every stripe um noticed uh what's happening what what's happening in asbury because it's not the first time that this happened in asbury university there were at least two more times this happened in the past and this is the third instance, the first one in the 21st century. And some of the folks who were fascinated about this um, quote-unquote revival or reawakening or this uh, 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 
and some are even going out of a limb to uh, to claim that it was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I digress. Uh, some of them, some of them are Catholics. There's this EWTN story or a uh, news clip wherein a Catholic priest who was a um, a few minutes drive away from Asbury University, he just went there to observe, and then a Catholic student or a Cath- uh, someone who is Catholic who was attending uh, the uh, nonstop service uh, noticed that he was a Catholic priest, and this person. I don't know if this is a male or a female or whatever. Uh, this person approached this priest and asked him uh, if he can, uh, if he can, uh, if this person can confess to him, since he's a Catholic, he wants to go to. Con- this person wants to go to confession, and uh, uh, th- this guy asked the priest if he's available for confession, and uh, good enough that the priest is good for confession, and. Um, um <laughs> if EWTN featured something that is a little bit protestant it's going to be big it is big because uh EWTN as we know as um its its branding is that it is the global catholic net- network and rightfully so uh thanks be to god for mother angelica and uh EWTN is not the only catholic um i um agency or catholic media outlet that um covered this there's also church militant there's a uh, um there's this uh program called forward boldly by christine niles and uh, she was a former protestant and she understood what these students in asbury university were coming from and while she has uh, her own reservations for it uh at the very least uh she says her ha- her heart goes out to it i would link uh, the stories or the stories that uh, I would mention here in the video uh, in the video description below if uh, if this release if this gets released on YouTube there's it's also in the show notes on Spotify oh another another post prod thought anyway um you know I I don't know if I already mentioned this in the original recording but you know the chosen is no substitute of the Bible, okay? There is uh, a lot of things that I'm a bit questionable about when it comes to theology, but you know, as I said in the, as I said earlier, it is, uh, it is meant for entertainment and not uh, entertainment and evangelization, and it's no substitute for a theology class. So, I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to blurt that out because there are a lot of people are uh, who are concerned about the uh, the chosen and rightfully so, but yeah, I'm just trying to balance it out. You know, you know what I mean. Anyway, back to the recording. By the way, um, other than uh the big Catholic media outlets, there were also YouTubers and other. Um, other independent creators who happen to be Catholic who are very much fascinated with the Asbury revival. There's this uh, uh, channel called the Black That Black Catholic Chick. Basically, uh, she's a, a black Catholic woman. And um, I'm really hooked with her explanation for this. I am that I definitely that I uh, insta subbed on her. That's for sure. I would also link her video on the, the Asprey Revival in the description below. There's also Cameron Bertuzzi, uh, who uh, recently converted to Catholicism and um, was really fascinated about the Asbury Revival because he was formerly a Protestant. And then, um, I also uh, I also had, um, I also uh, watched um, the response of a Dominican priest in... United States, as well as uh, as a diocesan priest. I'm not sure where this is, but uh, given the accent, it's uh, this guy is from America. Uh, he basically um, ingrained or uh, included the Asbury Revival and Jesus Revolution in his homily for the second Sunday of Lent, uh, in which the gospel is about the transfiguration. 
So, uh, it was so seamless. I really listened to it. I would also link the homily in the description below. Uh, what else? I think that's all that I can say about um, <laughs> the Asbury revival. But before that, I going back to Jesus Revolution, I just... Uh, uh, one of my uh, basis for creating this um, video in the very first place is this um, comment from the official trailer of Jesus Revolution uh, on Lionsgate's official YouTube channel. Lionsgate actually wa uh, released Jesus Revolution to uh, American theaters at the very least. Uh, there's this one comment that reads, Wow! This looks absolutely amazing. Who else laughed out loud when they opened the door when they opened the door um pertaining to one of the characters in the movie to find quote unquote Jesus from the chosen saying this house has a very good vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that very much uh that very much made me laugh because if you watch the trailer, I would also link it in the description below um, or in the show notes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jonathan Rumi's uh, character, uh, as I said, is Lonnie Frisbee. He's a hippie preacher. And then in that scene, Lonnie was in the front door of, uh, I'm not sure of the pastor's name, uh, the the first name is Chuck. I am not sure of the last name, but uh, uh, Lonnie was in front of Chuck's house, and then uh, his uh, Chuck's wife opens the door to find Lonnie uh, looking like Jesus <laughs> from the Chosen <laughs> because of his uh, of his facial hair and his long hair and all that, and then he just says, "This house has a very good vibe," <laughs> in the most hippie. In the most hippie way possible. I can never imagine Jonathan Rumi <laughs> uh, doing other roles than being Jesus from The Chosen. I mean, goodness gracious me, that was phenomenal. Um, even if it was just a trailer. Although I do have my own reservations about it because um, there are also uh, some people who say that uh, the filmmakers uh, discredited uh, Lonnie F uh, discredited the fact that Lonnie Frisbee uh, relapsed into uh, his um, into his former misery like uh, Mary Magdalene from the Chosen uh, before he died. So uh, that's just tragic. But as it is, uh, it's not. It I think it was not. Uh, the point of that film if uh, if we deal with the story uh, again I am just uh, trying to make this uh, as secular as possible uh, in reviewing but I would love to see the film that's for sure even if I'm a Catholic anyway we go to the Asbury, Asbury revival now and what is the Catholic response to this, aside from the things that I have mentioned earlier? First off, the American Church has a Eucharistic revival since the first Sunday of Advent. So basically, the Catholic Church in the United States is uh, renewing, its, um, renewing its commitment uh, that Catholics should believe in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist and believe that the host in the in that is being consecrated every mass is the body blood soul and divinity of Jesus Christ it's not a it's not as big as a problem uh, as it is here in the Philippines but you know it is really concerning that it's uh that a lot of people are uh, having this growing sense of uh, growing sense of uh, disbelief or um, sacrilege even and I am not and as of this recording there's uh, there's this social media post on Facebook 
uh, from uh, from one of us here in the Philippines. Uh, basically examining the sacred host. It's already consecrated. It was distributed in Holy Communion. And this person, for some reason, maliciously uh, reviewed uh, its physical attributes, even though it's already the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. As a Catholic, I have very strong, very, very strong uh, opinions or perspectives regarding the Eucharist. As you may notice in some of my uh, videos here on YouTube. And it's just concerning that we are imitating those bloody Yanks. We're imitating the Yanks in their disregard, their utter disregard to religion. And it's disturbing. I have to say it's disturbing. And the American church is, um, or the American uh, and Christians in the United States are also testing the spirits if the Asbury rev revival is really real. Because there are some who really are detracting the Asbury revival or the, uh, the incidents that happened in Asbury. And how about that? Uh, how about, how about us in the Philippines? Because you might be commenting in the comment section, Ian, that's happening overseas. That's over the that's in the other side of the Pacific. Wala naman nangyayari dyan sa Pilipinas. Um, wala naman nangyayari na ganito dito sa Pilipinas. It's, there's nothing that's happening here in the Philippines. Why should we care? And this is why. We are in the season of Lent. And we are called to spend Lent meaningfully. Not only by prayer, fasting, and abstinence, but also by being ourselves. This is easier said than done though, because I am uh, also struggling with this. If you think that uh, I've been there, done that, no. It's not just that. It's not just a case of been there, done that. It's an everyday struggle, and I myself am struggling about this. If I am talking to you right now and I'm saying that I'm struggling, that only means that you are not alone. I'm also trying to comprehend everything that's happening. And I'm going to continue doing so as long as I live. So... It is a challenge for all of us to work on our faith on our faith and strengthen it to develop a mental and spiritual workout not just a physical one yes i cycle but at the same time i also if given the opportunity to cycle alone i would talk to god i would pray while i'm while i'm pedaling i would all I would try to pray not only for myself and for me to uh, uh, safely arrive in whatever destination I am uh, pedaling to, but also to uh, guide me in where would I go in my life, with my life. It's not just about the physical destination, but also the spiritual one. So that's just uh, something that I am very much uh, into at this point. And before we conclude this, uh, this episode of the Intrepid Podcast, I do have some uh, afterthoughts when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, this episode. I do hope that the people behind The Chosen would... Uh, would include the harrowing of hell in its final season, in season 7. Because uh, if I am not mistaken, uh, some pundits uh, that have been uh, following The Chosen much more than I do are saying that the crucifixion, the passion of Jesus, would be in season 6. So season 7 would be the aftermath. And that's going to be the resurrection, the ascension, and, my, and, and probably the Pentecost. The Pentecost would be the 
um, would be the uh, the final episode of the final season. But I do hope that uh, Dallas and uh, the the writers of the Chosen would consider the harrowing of hell as as uh, as episode one of season seven. That's just my hope. Also, uh, I I do hope that it would be um as um as candid and humorous as possible humorous as boss as possible so that uh Jesus uh would conquer hell and uh would be reunited with Joseph and John the Baptist. I would definitely vouch that um that it would be a very touching scene if Jesus would see jo- uh, Joseph and John the Baptist uh leading all of the souls of the righteous from uh from Sheol which is basically the uh the old testament um dwelling of the dead before uh the crucifixion and uh yeah it's gonna i am just imagining that if they if they do this i would cry i i would shed manly tears because of how uh how jonathan uh, acted out jesus when he remembered Joseph in season three, as well as John the Baptist too in season two, uh, so I would definitely love to see that. Also, uh, this is a uh, an extra thing. Uh, I also hope that um, Yasmin Al Bustani, uh, who plays uh, Ra- Rama or Rama, uh, would sing the Magnificat because, if I'm not mistaken. Yasmin uh, also sings. She can sing, but uh, I just hope that she would consider, um, or Dallas would consider, uh, tapping her musical talent, uh, the little musical talent that she has, that uh, she would sing the Magnificat, the Magnificat, or the song or the poem uh, that uh, Mother Mary uh, made. That's in the Bible, and that's in the Bible. So, um. I would love to. Uh, I would love for our uh, Rama to sing the Magnificat um, uh, somewhere in the future. That's for sure. Also, an- another afterthought before we end this, or uh, before we conclude this uh, podcast episode, I would just like to. Uh, I would just like to address uh, the questions that how about of how about Pope Francis. Honestly, I do not understand Pope Francis. And uh, as a Catholic, and as someone who has been um, who has been used to clarity, used to uh, the sense of the sacred, and all that, I don't understand him. Yet, he is the Pope. There's nothing I can do about it. And I can only pray for him. Because everything has been said and done. And I just wanted to uh, uh, to let you know that even though I have my memes and my, uh, and my sarcastic thoughts and my cynical thoughts about Pope Francis and what uh, he has been doing for the past 10 years, he's just a man given and and he and he is given this enormous and overwhelming task of shepherding God's people all i can do for him is to pray full stop and you might be asking me pray for what his conversion his uh uh his stepping down as pope his death whatever None of that, th- none of those things. I just wanted to pray for him that he may understand what God wants him to do. End of discussion about him. But having said that, I also pray that he would, I don't want to say excommunicate, but uh, perhaps 
the German church has already gone too far and gone rogue. So, I guess excommunicate would be the best, uh, the, uh, the best term for this. I just hope that the Pope would excommunicate the German church because of their synodal way and their uh, heterodox uh, upbringing. If you're a German Catholic who uh, who is absolutely affected by this, I am very sorry. And I just wanted to let you know that this isn't some kind of schadenfreude. But if you're a German Catholic and you understand that your hierarchy is has gone the other way, I am very sorry for you. But you and I would understand what I'm saying here. In the end, I just hope that we all pray for the Catholic Church. That's just me. So, in conclusion of this podcast, there would only be two outcomes in the outpouring of Christian content in the aftermath of COVID-19. One, many people will have a greater awareness for the concept of Christianity, but have an uncertain qual- quality of believers. And this is basically the, if, you're, if you remember the parable of the sower, uh, that's basically uh, the seed that fell into thorny ground. They grew up, they sprout out quickly, but they were choked to death by thorns. Or, two, some of them are transformed into becoming Christ-like individuals whose faith is absolutely unshakable and we all hope to be that case. To be the seed that, to be the seed or to be the, uh, to be the fertile ground wherein the seed would sprout, grow, and bear fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, or more. Either way, only God and time will tell. And to conclude this episode of the Intrepid Podcast, I would like to pray Psalm 77. The reason why I would, love, I would like to uh, recite this to you as a prayer is because it was um quoted in the season finale of uh, the chosen season 3 and it is not just a penitential psalm it's actually also a psalm wherein someone is furious in god but even though he's furious even though he's frustrated the psalmist still praises God, and that's what's important. I would also pray the collect for Ash Wednesday as in the, in the English uh, divine office, whether it's Anglican or Catholic ordinariate, uh, this is prayed as the second collect in the divine office for both Matins and Evensong. That said, let us pray. I will cry unto God with my voice. Even unto God will I cry with my voice, and he shall hearken unto me. In the time of my trouble I sought the Lord. My sore ran and ceased not in the night season. My soul refused comfort. When I am in heaviness, I will think upon God. When my heart is vexed, I will complain. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so feeble that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old and the years that are past. I call to remembrance my song 
and in the night I commune with mine own heart and search out my spirits. Will the Lord absent himself forever? And will he be no more entreated? Is his mercy clean gone forever? And his promise come utterly to an end forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? And will he shut up his loving kindness in displeasure? And I said, It is mine own infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most Highest. I will remember the works of the Lord, and call to mind thy wonders of old time. I will think also of all thy works, and my talking shall be of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is holy. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doeth wonders, and hast declared thy power among the people. Thou hast mightily delivered thy people, even the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee, and were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water the air thundered, and thine arrows went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was heard round about. The lightnings shone upon the ground. The earth was moved and shook withal. Thy way is in the sea, and thy paths in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou ledest thy people like sheep by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing but thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all them that are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. On that note, I end today's podcast. I would like to thank you all for listening so far. The recording of this episode would be available on both YouTube and Spotify. The links to them are also in the description below. There would, also be, there would also be further plans to expand to other platforms, so make sure to check out for that. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, all of the materials I have referenced for this episode would be listed in the recording's description and in the show notes on Spotify. If you think there are things that I might not have included in this recording, or if you want to have your say about the matter, please feel free to leave them in the comments below if applicable. And with all that said, this is Intrepidi and Reñon reminding you to at all times, now more than ever in this season of Lent, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Until then, look alive, stay alive, be kind to yourself and to each other, and thank you for tuning in. From here in Intrepid HQ, see you next time for another talk here in the Intrepid Podcast. Have a meaningful Lent. Ian out.